Each episode of Education with an Edge is meant to create, cultivate, and inspire honest discussion about issues affecting youth. Hosted by author, artist, educator, advocate, and speaker, Jaquel Lane. Hello, this is Education with an Edge, and I am your host, Jaquel Lane. Education with an Edge is the podcast that is dedicated to all things youth because we believe that every child matters, and that is what you should believe. Today, I have two exceptional guests with us, uh, awesome teachers and artists, Sarah Kolb and Mary Daly. Um, This is a super special interview for me because I've had the privilege of teaching with both Sarah and Mary, and I can honestly say that they make my life and their students' lives so much fun every single day, and we need more of that in this world. Um, They are both very, very passionate educators and artists, and they are especially passionate about educating others about the importance of art in the classroom and how it can be helpful to students who deal with trauma. So thank you, Sarah and Mary, for being with us on Education with an edge today. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks for having us. Yes, we love you, Jen. We (laughs) love, I love you. I love you guys. Oh my gosh. Um, So, I mean, since this podcast is like geared towards kids and parents and mentors who are trying to maybe encourage a child to think about different education paths or like different ways of getting to their goals and their dreams. Um, Looking back on a childhood memory, what did you dream of becoming when you grew up and why? And we'll start. Mary, you want to go? I can go first. Okay. Yay. That's fine. (laughs) I, um, as a child and still to this day, I'm drawn to so many different avenues of life and for me I think as a child I was such an animal lover that I wanted to be a veterinarian I would look at books of like puppies I I would sit and just flip through the pages but I it was anything that I was interested in which was I'm kind of like a ferret anything shiny I just kind of (laughs) grab go toward but yeah first it's the animals then it's cooking then it's baking you know my mom really let us kind of go into the kitchen and experiment and get her hands dirty. And I'm so grateful for that because I can go to this day to the pantry and come up with like a meal really Absolutely. easily. Because my mom let me explore that at a really Absolutely. young age. So That's awesome. I grew up with a lot of family in the medical fields, nurses. Um, so I really wanted to be a nurse or like I wanted to be a firefighter at one time. Um, <laughs> I a clothing designer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of all over the place too. But my family was really supportive. I love that. Of, you know, whatever avenue I wanted to. Focus and we on. should. We should encourage kids because it's like you're so young and having to make that right. decision. You gotta try a lot of a lot of different things. So um so also because we are on a roll with inspiring young people, what do you think the most significant obstacle or challenge of your youth was? And how did you overcome it? I personally did not have a lot of challenges. I grew up very privileged, didn't have to worry about anything. And when I look back at it, I'm sometimes embarrassed of how I didn't realize at the time how privileged I was. Um, But now as an adult, I try and use that privilege to help others. Absolutely. Um, And you do. And and I've tried to educate myself, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've worked in the community of North Omaha for my whole teaching career. So just spending time in or outside of my bubble, I guess. Absolutely. Has taught me a lot. Absolutely. Um, I think for me, I mean, when I, there's probably, like Sarah said, I did, I grew up kind of in a bubble as well, huge family. And so there was definitely a a pecking order. I was number five. So I kind of, you know, had to learn right away how to live with others and yeah. how to get along. And and we spent a lot of time together because it's not like my mom could take us anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. Was six of us. <laughs> there was six of you. But I think about soccer and like how I started soccer and I always loved it because I would play with my older sister. And I didn't excel. Like some of the kids were so just athletic in my class. I mean, they were side tackling and doing all sorts of things. <laughs> And I was new to it, and I, you know, it made me not want to go, but my parents were like, we signed you up for soccer, we paid for it, you've got the cleats, and you're just going to be who you are on the field, and that's it, you know? And so I think that any time that you don't excel at something naturally, and you have to really, like, get awkward and 
deep down and figure out what your place is in it, like that can be very uncomfortable. I love that though, because that's like where the growth happens, right? Like that's where, I mean, we should force ourselves to do that. Like that's good. That's cool. Okay. Um, so can you both tell our audience what art means to you personally and then why you decided to become art teachers? I personally love that you can be creative and use all different types of materials to make something beautiful. Um, I, when I was in school, did a lot of like cookie cutter art projects yes. in my um, I went to a private school, a private Catholic school, yeah. and we had art once a week. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you did something on paper, and they all kind of look the same. So I really <laughs> strive now as a teacher to be creative, let students choose materials. Um, and I honestly didn't really enjoy school as a kid. So my really main passion is getting kids to buy into their education and to love learning. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Sarah. Mary. Yes. And we're all benefiting from yes, it today, we are. Sarah. Oh, um, stop. I, uh, I didn't, growing up, going to parochial school, we didn't have art. We did craft. Like the teacher, you know, maybe you'd make a bug for the science project or <laughs> yeah. something like that. Like, I remember, though, in fourth grade, I that's when I kind of found out I could draw because we did this, like, castles. Ooh kind of project, like, well, it wasn't castles, but to me it was castles. <laughs> but I, get, I got you. Oh. And I remember I drew, and uh, I had done it at home and worked on it all night, and I think I used my dad's, like, encyclopedias, yeah. one of those gold leaf ones, and <laughs> looked at a bunch of stuff, and I drew a night, and nobody believed I did it. So then oh. when I, then they made me challenge and draw in front of them, and then it was like, I, could, I think I can actually like you're draw talented. kind of good. Yeah. So, and then in high school, that's really the first time that I actually had an art class. And that just kind of solidified everything for me. My teacher was, she worked so well with little resources. And she we did batik. Like, I remember that's when I fell in love with process. Like, yes. the process yeah. of art. And then not only that, but there's so much socially that happens in the art room. Yeah. And, you know, you learn how to have conversations that are political, that are like, you know, there's just so much that goes down in that room. And I felt so happy and like, I just succeeded. It's like the opposite of soccer. Right. Like I actually had a little (laughs) bit of, you know, like headway on some other people with art. And so, yeah, that was, that was definitely for me. I'm like, that was always in the back of my head then, no matter what I pursued, like I could do art. Yeah, I could do art for sure. It's like your safe place or like your happy place. Almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think it is that for a lot of kids too, which is um, what we're going to talk about. So you both are obviously, and I can attest to this from working with you both, very interested in young people. Um, but one area that you are both extremely passionate about in terms of how is art and how art therapy can actually help students deal with trauma that they have experienced. So can you guys both elaborate on this and tell our listeners a little more about this? Because I think this is super, super important, especially right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, here's the hard truth is that 61% of men and 51% of women have experienced trauma in the United States. Wow. And 26% of kids before the age of four have experienced trauma. So it's just a reality that's teaching in a public school system Mm -hmm. where we teach everyone, no matter their socioeconomic status, race, background, we are going to have kids that have experienced trauma. Absolutely. Um, So educating yourself on what that looks like and what some of the behaviors um, that those kids might exhibit and how you as an educator can respond to those. to make the student feel safe, to help them build skills, because they can build that resilience up. Absolutely. You just need to help them. So I think educating ourselves is really important. We were lucky enough to go to the Nebraska Art Teachers Association Fall Conference in Nebraska City. Mary and I made a day of it. Very cool. And the keynote speaker was Dr. Donalyn Heiss, and she has the book Art for Children Experiencing Psychological Trauma. And it was really just like a few of the points she made 
from the book as far as like art lessons, art materials to use, um, ways to help build that confidence in the kids, I thought was so helpful. And totally hit home for for us, yeah. For you guys. Mm -hmm. And that was such a beautiful day too because it was a room full of Mm -hmm. educators that all want the same thing. We all have the common goal of like, how do we implement this and how can we take it as far as it can go? Yes. And she just kind of, especially for middle school, just the way that she she talked about a lesson, like just, you know, for example, making a monster. But then you're thinking about what's your fear that you want that monster to take care of. So it oh, opens wow. up this dialogue, you know, and we're not therapists. So, you know, but you can take it to a level because I just think, you know, it's an aid. We've been doing art since the cave painting, music. Yes. You know, I mean, there's yes. just so many storytelling. There's so many things that are innate. There's nothing new age about art, you know, or right. dance or anything like that, even though people want to make it seem that way. But there are so much, there's so much research behind um, what this can do, what art therapy can do, and just what it does to the brain and all the benefits of the brain. Like, you know, you've got your left and right hemisphere that are communicating. And this opens up all these. It's so good for learning. You're yes. problem solving. Mm-hmm. You are, not only does it relieve stress, but it boosts memory, clarity, mental focus. And it helps, it actually helps your brain neurons to grow because of that. And so there's just like, you get to flex your imagination. It might be, I tell my kids all the time, it might be the only time today that you're problem solving. And yeah, it yes. might be with paper mache and you might be really angry. <laughs> but that's the joy of art is working through that that awkwardness. And, you know, it's 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 really something I could talk all day about this. No, and how and you, I mean, and that's, too. that's what like we're here for. But I told both of you, like one of the best days of my like educational career was when I had to sub for one of you and we got to make paper mache flowers. So it was like the best day of my life because how like, even though I, I teach English language arts, it's pretty scripted what we do. Mm-hmm. And I just said, I walked away and it's also very cathartic, right? Which is probably what it is for these kids that are, struggling you know well, it's very well, methodical right and for a lot of them giving them a choice of materials or yes. um more choice-based art with like project based choices just giving them that ownership and giving them the ability to choose because a lot of them feel powerless in their lives in they're their lives. That's a 11 good point. 12 That's a good 13 point. years old um we have a lot of Students who are in foster care who just get bounced around constantly and, like, maybe school is their only constant thing. So providing a safe space for them to be able to explore and make choices is really important to both of us, I think, in our classrooms. Oh, I can attest to that for both of you. Yeah. I mean, if I was a kid, I would have wanted to be in, I would want to be in your class for sure. It's just a happy, happy place. I want to be in your class as well. (laughs) (laughs) You can come in anytime, girl. Um, So, I mean, and this is, this is a, you know, this is definitely an opinion question, but what, what in your opinion is, is one of the largest obstacles facing public education today? Oh, how do I just do one? I mean, there's so many. I think one of the biggest is we expect these kids to be inside sitting for eight hours a day. Yeah. Which is stupid, quite (laughs) frankly. These kids are little balls of energy. They need to be outside exploring. They need to do more hands-on things in all of their classes, like we are not setting them up for success and shoving like standardized tests down their throat and, um, you know, just making them sit all day. We see a lot of behaviors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and they're not good. And all they're the time. <laughs> not always, not always positive. As a result. <laughs> um, I think that one of the biggest obstacles is that there's just not enough bodies in the school. Oh, there's yeah. just not enough support or support staff. There's just not enough funding for us to really do what we need to do with, you know, when students, when you have a lot of students that have experienced extreme trauma, and not only that, but I mean, we need to completely break down our curriculum with the implicit bias that's, I mean, right now, especially like we've got this pandemic 
And now it's like, I mean, this has been a looming black cloud in America for a long time and the bias. And I think that what we have is a tidal wave coming our way, but no support around us. And so it's like, you know, all the hats that you wear as a teacher, you know, um, and so I I think that there's there's a, a lot of obstacles. I don't know what kind of But I think that that's important for our listeners to know, you know, because somebody and even when even when the COVID thing hit, and I'll be honest, it's, you know, a lot of people and I know you guys too, but we have wonderful supportive parents, but I even saw more people come out in support of teachers nationwide, you know, yeah. that were like, thank you for what you do. You know, we had no idea um, they're homeschooling their kids now. And so I think it is important because unless you're a teacher, you don't know what goes on on a daily basis. And you don't, right. you know, everyone kind of says we want to help teachers. We want to do this. Um and we're grateful, right? But if there's not a voice, if we don't lend voices to amazing teachers like you guys that are like, hey, we're out there. We're in the trenches. We're trying for your kids every single day. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that I think it's important. And, and you both make extraordinarily valid points. One other giant issue before we move on to the next point. No, you're good. <laughs> classroom sizes. Yeah. <laughs> and especially when you have kids who have experienced trauma or numerous kids in one room of like 32 bodies and you, there's one adult there's that's going to trigger kids who have experienced trauma Absolutely. so not being able to work with these kids on an individual or small group setting is not setting them up for success at all right and just basically creating problems more I'm, problems for them i'm so glad that you that you touched on that because that's yeah, that's number, I mean, one, where if, if you're just in a, a noisy, crowded room, it's going to make right. things escalate a lot of for these you. Kids, you get them one on one. And they're perfect. And they're wonderful. Yeah. But when you put them in a room with all these other people or someone that's constantly picking on them, everyone has a breaking point. Absolutely. It adds another, it adds another dynamic. Um, so if you, so now we've talked about some of the things that, you know, some of the obstacles. If you had all of the resources in the world, <laughs> As a teacher, <laughs> just uh, the genie just rubbed that lamp and <laughs> he just popped out and um, yeah, and, and gave you whatever you wanted. Um, what would you have in your art classrooms? Like, how would you guys design like or what would you ask for? Like if you had all the resources in the, you know, in the world. It, would it have to be in the classroom? No, no. I would love to like take our kids like. I want to be the magic school bus and take our kids on like <laughs> yes. Miss Frizzle crazy <laughs> vacations. Like, let's go to the Louvre. I want them to travel and see things. Yeah. And we do a lot of that just through looking at pictures yeah. or videos. Like, they have virtual tours of the caves in Lascaux, France, yeah. which is amazing. We didn't have that when we were young. But I would love to take the kids yeah. around, introduce them to artists, art museums. That would be super cool. Yeah. Super, super cool. The first thing I thought when you asked this question was, <laughs> I would love to have a large tree in my room. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very zen. Like, like just, yeah, bringing nature inside. Um, I was in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago, and there was a bunch of children flying kites next to the sea on an old, yeah. like, military ground. And I was like, this is Stunning. such a great like place for these students to be and see. So I think, yeah, if we could take them to experience more, something happens in your brain when you look at a piece of art, you're, you know, the neural pl- pathways are similar to what the artist was doing when they were creating. And it, 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 it's to actually be in that physical space and see it, you know, three dimensional art, like is so, and a lot of classrooms too, We've got teachers, like when I was going into art, I got really, really lucky and hit the jackpot by having a room, a beautiful room to boot. But there's teachers that are on carts, and I just kept thinking, like, what can we do for them? Because that really negates 3D art. Right. Like, dimensional art is so, it's so important. Um, And not only that, but to go back to what I said before, one of the big obstacles is, is if I could have someone in my room so that I could, like, go use the bathroom. (laughs) 
just waiting for someone to say that. I'm like, no, that would be my like number one. Or like, work one on one with a kid while someone else right. helps facilitate. Absolutely. Yes. If I could have yeah, another kind of on our own. Just another body. You know, I'd have like thirty eighth graders with all different needs and then I felt like, you know, it was so hard for me to meet those needs and have you know, those those quiet kids kind of can fall through the cracks and because and you're on managing top of behavior. It, you have to use the restroom. And you also <laughs> you have also to use the restroom the whole time. It's such so, a teacher joke. Like it's turned into so, yeah. I mean, I'm supposed to drink water, right? <laughs> Not so too much. Yeah. That would be part of it. It's just a water. Oh, yeah. Drinking water whenever I want. I love it. That would be a dream. <laughs> the little things. The little stuff. <laughs> um so looking back. Um, 20 years from now, what do you want to be remembered for by your students? Mine is so simple. Mine is, and I've been teaching long enough that I see former students when I used to teach down at um, North High School. But just having them come up to me and being like, hey, Miss Cold, they remember my name. Yes. Hey, thank you so much. Like, I really enjoyed your class. I'm doing this now, just catching up with me, like just seeing them thrive is so gratifying to me. Excellent. I, I, that's, I would second that. It melts my heart. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. 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 I would, I would hope that, that they are still, because they get enough out of the art that they've created that they're still creating. Because I think it's so important for people. You don't have to have this like specific defined talent. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. that's societal. Like it's pressure. You don't have to have that. Just if you're creating, if you're sitting down and you're doing something, I think that's really important. And and like Sarah said, I just, I had a a friend of mine's son. I, I taught him how to do origami. Oh, cool. When he was small, and he's now an architect, and he does a lot of stuff. And he told me, he just graduated and moved to Seattle, and he actually told me, like, yeah. That inspired him. You know, to have, I mean, we've got some kids that are so just intelligent, visual, spatial. Yes. Like, things I'll never understand or know. Right. I'll never come close to it. They've already got it. And to introduce them to that, um, and, you know, that's that's part of my job. I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to ignite something, you know. And so if anything, even if even if you're just able to do it for meditative purposes or through stress or if you're still creating art in in it's because you liked what you did in my class, then I've done my job. So that would be really satisfying <laughs> if that happened. It it will and I know that it does. Um every single day. Um so uh, one thing that we, we need to talk about before we close here is that these two have an amazing art club and they also have an Instagram where they showcase the projects that they've done with their kiddos. So where can people go to find that? Um, so our Instagram handle yes. or name is <laughs> Alfonza Davis Art and Pottery. Alfonso Davis, Art and Pottery on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, so we'll feature cool. different, um, you know, what we're doing in our classrooms or we'll put things up so parents can see what we're doing um, to share ideas and just another way to reach our students absolutely. and support them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, ladies, both for being with us here today on Education with an Edge. Um These are two teachers that are doing great things uh, with our youth, and that's what Education with an Edge is all about, is highlighting the true heroes out there who are working with our kids, and we hope that you learned a lot today. I know that I certainly did about art and trauma, so thank you both, Sarah and Mary, for being here with us today. That is, once again, Education with an Edge, and I am Jaquel Lane, your host, dedicated to our youth, because every child matters, and they are our future. If you have a question or just want to learn more, go to jaquellane.com. Thanks for listening to Education with an Edge.